you all here. Are you tired? Are you exhausted? Are you done learning yet? Or is there room left up here? Did you save some room? Yeah? Good, 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 good. Well, um, my name is Scott Davis. We're going to be talking about web components here. Um, some of my talks uh, might be more aspirational or future looking. This is a talk that I want to emphasize. This is technology that you can use right here, right now, today. As a matter of fact, on my last several projects, this is the technology we were using, web components. So I don't want you to think for a moment that this talk is future um, facing at all. This is talk that, um, this is a technology that I would hope you would leave uh, here and uh, go back and start using tomorrow. So web components. How many of you consider yourselves web developers? Kind of a silly question, isn't it? Yes, of course, web developers. So we all have our favorite frameworks, don't we? And I'm not going to play the dichotomy game on you and ask you uh, which one's better, Angular or React or Knockout or Vue. I just saw the Vue uh, talk earlier today. I really enjoyed that. That seems like an interesting framework. But I want to start here with Angular and specifically Angular 2. And by Angular 2, of course, I mean Angular 4, right? Yes. Um, but the latest version of Angular that came out this year. Um, uh, we, uh, we, we used it. I was the chief web architect on a project, and this was the technology we were using. So we had lots of good hands-on with it. But we're here to talk about web components. And what's interesting is when you go to the very first Hello World in Angular, they start talking about components right off the bat. Now, components can mean two very different things. Components can be a general term like widgets or thingies, right? And that's one way we can think of this. But also, when we start talking about web components with a capital W and a capital C, we mean something very specific. These are actual W3C specifications, the World Wide Web Consortium. These are actual technologies that are a native part of the browser. So the reason I'm making this distinction here is because they say, well, Angular applications are made up of components. And they go on to give a pretty decent definition of what a component is. A component is a combination of a template and JavaScript behavior. Yeah? And so that's both the definition of what a generic component is, but it's also a definition of what an actual web component is as well. So we're going to see a number of different examples of how to build components, some of them what I call organic or based on the W3C specs. And some of them are synthetic, which means it's a pure JavaScript construct. And I don't mean synthetic in a bad sense of the word. I just mean that they don't follow the web component specification. But thankfully, Angular does deal with organic components. It does deal with web Component. So we can use this as a good way of kind of evaluating what modern web development looks like. Because in fact, there's very little Angular code on the screen right now. If we go and look at this first line, this import component from Angular core, you say, oh, I've never seen that before. That must be Angular. Is that Angular code? No, where does that construct come from, import? ES6, yes. JavaScript, the latest version of JavaScript. ES6, uh, technically ES7 is the latest version, but this is something that's been in the language since 2015. So you look at that and say, well, that's not Angular. That's just JavaScript. That's plain old web development. OK, I like that. But notice what they're importing. They're importing this idea of a component class. And we said that a component is a template and behavior. Now, this is a very simple one. It doesn't have any behavior, per se, but it does have a template. And you'll notice the other word there, selector. I believe Venkat mentioned that in his talk earlier today. Selector is a CSS selector. It's a jQuery selector, which is really a CSS selector, right? Yeah. Um, but this selector is defining what the name of our new element is, because that's a really important definition of what a web component is. It's a brand new HTML element. It's an HTML element that you are creating on your own. We have a bunch of perfectly good elements already. Paragraph, 
headers, anchors, images, yeah? But sometimes you want to be able to go and build your own component. So this selector tells me that this component is going to be an element named my app. And the template, what it's going to display is hello and the name you supply. So this is what it looks like in action. We will have a new element all around there called my app. It'll be name. Name equals Angular in this point. And so what we would expect to be rendered out of that is hello, Angular. Does that make sense? Because this is an Angular specific way to build out web components. So let's look at another very popular web framework, React. Now, did I ask how many of you are using Angular? Let's ask. How many of you are using uh, Angular 2 or later, a modern version of Angular? A couple hands go up, not very many. How many of you are using Angular 1, the previous version? I'd expect, yeah, some hands, but let's go up. Uh, React, how many of you are using React JS? Oh, okay, very interesting. React has about 50% of the market these days. So right now, React is kind of the hot web framework. Although we know from my previous talk, there's not just one web framework out there. They're all very popular and do things differently. But we want to focus on the similarities at this point. So just like Angular started by saying, hey, everything we do is component-based. React says right on their home page, hey, everything we do is component-based. But they're going to help us further refine this definition of what a component is. They go on to say that React will help us build encapsulated components. Components that manage their own state. That's interesting, isn't it? So the idea of encapsulation is that this is going to be a single unit that we'll be able to pass around. And it'll have that template and behavior and dependencies. Yeah, I'll carry along with it. So we have these lovely component-based, uh, excuse me, encapsulated components. And by doing a component-based architecture, we start now moving towards a more declarative way to doing programming. Venkat mentioned this as well, the difference between imperative programming and declarative. Declarative is, I want you to do this. Imperative is, I'm going to tell you how to do this. Yeah? So a very declarative way of dealing with something is my wife can look at me and she says, Scott, you stink. P.U. I want you to take a shower before dinner. And that's all she has to say, right? I stink. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I stink, definitely. OK, so I will go up, take a shower before dinner. I come down, and I will stink less. Not 100% less, but some, some important percentage less, yes? Now, I mentioned I also have a teenage son. Do you think my wife is able to use that same approach with young Christopher? She can't take a declarative approach with him, right? She has to take an imperative approach. She has to say, Chris, I want you to go up and take a, a shower before dinner. In order to do that, you're going to have to put down the video game. So put down the video game. Yes, OK, good, good. Now I want you to go upstairs. I want you to turn on the water in the shower. I want you to get in the shower. I want you to take off your clothes before you get in the shower. But I want you to get in the shower. I want you to use soap on your body. I want you to use shampoo on your head. I want you to dry off after you're done. I want you to put on clean clothes, not the same dirty clothes you're wearing before. And then I want you to come down and join us for dinner. That's a very imperative approach, right? And there's still a very good chance that he will have found a loophole, yes, and still not have satisfied her requirements. So being declarative means we don't get bogged down with implementation details. You can see how that works really nicely with this idea of encapsulation. Encapsulation means we carry all that behavior and templates along with us. And the declarative nature of it means that we can't get in and be bothered with the impl implementation details. So this is how you define a component in React. And what I love is this is React's Hello World example. And they're doing the same thing that the Angular folks were doing. But we can see right away that they're using a different syntax to get there. If we say that templates are really nothing more, components are nothing more than a template and behavior, one of the things we notice right away is the templates are different in React. They use something called JSX. And JSX is a synthetic 
template. Uh, da, da, template. That doesn't mean it's bad. It just means that this is a, a JavaScript-only solution. This isn't a web components template. This isn't a W3C component template. This is just a nice kind of JavaScript way to do it. And this is important to recognize. Because if you are building out your templates in JSX, are you going to get any kind of reuse if you change frameworks? Are you going to be able to take these JSX templates along with you and use them somewhere else? Probably not. JSX is probably a good solution if you're staying in React and probably not a good solution if you're going somewhere else. Notice we still have classes extending methods in there. It's extending a React component. Notice we still have this idea of we've got hello, but we're uh, uh, doing string interpolation in a slightly different way. But there's something else really subtle and important I want you to notice. If you're writing true organic web components, they must have a hyphen in the name. And that sounds like an odd requirement. But if you look at all the native HTML elements, not a single one has a hyphen in it. Paragraph, h1, anchor, image, headers, body, head, yeah? And so at a glance, if I'm looking through HTML and I see elements that I don't recognize that have a hyphen in them, oh, I have a pretty good idea that this is a web component. This is a custom component. I can look at React in a heartbeat and say, oh, I can tell this isn't a standard HTML component. But notice how this component is case sensitive. Are HTML elements normally case sensitive? No, I can use div in all uppercase or lowercase or just the capital I in the middle, right? HTML elements are not case sensitive. HTML elements must have a hyphen in them. So I look at something like this, and these are clearly synthetic components. That's not a bad thing. That's just an observation. Yeah? But we can see that these two frameworks are giving us similar capabilities, slightly different syntax, but the same idea. So now we come to Ember. Anyone using Ember in here? Yeah? Are you a Ruby on Rails developer? No. All that surprises me. Normally, that's the answer. Ember is a very Ruby on Rails-like framework. And so if you like Ruby on Rails, you'll probably enjoy Ember quite a bit. Now, this will be not surprising to you at all. In Ember, they say, oh, hey, we're going to allow you to create components. Beginning to see a pattern form here, yes? But these components are a little bit different. They mentioned that we're going to use handlebars for our components. Any of you using handlebars as your component library, or as your template library? I love handlebars. It really is probably my template library of choice. I love it. There's synthetic templates. It's all in JavaScript. But what Ember has done is they've taken a very popular templating framework, and they said, we'll build our framework around this. If you have built out your templates and handlebars, there's a good chance you will be able to pick them up and move them across different frameworks. Even though they're not organic templates, they still are templates that probably are going to offer you some form of reuse. In this case, they're giving us a slightly more complex component. They're trying to create a Gravatar image. And so you can see it's got a couple of attributes you can assign, a size and a name. Uh, when you go to build out the URL, this is the behavior that we were talking about, this behavior. We can see they're building up a well-formed URL. But when we go to use this component, that syntax looks different, doesn't it? They're using the double curly braces instead of the angle braces we would expect. It's still a component. We can still see that it's a Gravatar image with a hyphen in the name. We can still see it's got custom attributes. We can see that for all extents and purposes, this is no different than a React component or an Angular component. Just a slightly different syntactic path to get us here. Clearly synthetic, not organic. Yeah? Well, I could go on and on, but don't worry. I only go on one more time. There's one more framework I want to mention, and that's Polymer. Is anyone in here using Polymer or familiar with Polymer? Very few hands go up. A couple of them do. Do you like working in Polymer? Oh, no. OK. So you started with a project, you struggled, and you stopped. Oh, I wasn't here soon enough then. Is that what you're telling me? Uh, 
Interesting, interesting. So polymer you can end up using in a variety of different situations, a variety of different frameworks, a variety of different uh, uh, distribution mechanisms. I told you when I was chief web architect in an organization, um, we started with Angular 2, but after a while we found that the complexity budget was just too much. Angular 2 required so much complexity to get done what we were hoping to get done that we actually ended up moving away from it. We were already using web components, not Angular components, not React components or Ember components. We were using material design components. Because one of the things we really liked about Angular 2 is that it was component agnostic. Because it uses these organic components, anyone else that uses organic components as well would be able to play along. So in fact, our Angular 2 app, we're using quite a bit of material design elements. We are using Angular for routing and for validation and all those other things. And when we found that that was getting too complicated and we didn't like where it was going, we were able to maintain all of our material design templates, all of those existing components we were using, and turn around and use them here in Polymer. The reason we went with Polymer is Polymer is arguably the lightest of all of these frameworks. They say it right there is that we want to unlock the power of web components. We want to give you the ability to create these reusable HTML elements. But we are simply a thin bit of syntactic sugar over organic web components. I've heard the various uh, folks in this organization uh, give presentations at software conferences just like this, and they say, we're trying to program ourselves out of a job. Eventually, this is going to be so mainstream, every browser is going to support it, that maybe Polymer might cease to exist, and, and that's OK. They go on to say this even more forcefully by saying, hashtag, use the platform. And this really resonates with me. Because we look at something like React, which I like and which is very popular, but React has said, we believe the DOM is so slow that we're going to create our own virtual DOM in JavaScript. And we have these other templating options out here, but we create, believe we're going to create our own templating option in JavaScript. And so it's a lovely framework, but what they're doing is they're really isolating themselves, aren't they? Whereas something like Polymer says, we are going to leverage the platform. We are going to take advantage of these technologies that already exist in the browser. And we're just going to sugar them up to the point where they'll be easier to use. And eventually, you might not need the sugar anymore. And we're OK with that. So when we look at web components, I say, yes. When I see HTML imports and ECMAScript 6 modules, I say, oh, Wonderful. When I see service workers in HTTP2, I say, ah, this is from an organization, Google, who builds a web browser, Chrome, who builds a JavaScript engine, V8. And they said, we don't see this as a flawed platform that needs to be synthetically solved. We see this as a rich, robust platform that we want to lean into and take advantage of. I'm not arguing that one philosophy is better than the other. I will tell you I like Polymer's philosophy better because I think this will buy you long-term support. I just heard back from a client that I had worked with over 10 years ago, and it amazed me that they were still on the same code base. Now, this was a mapping application, and we had gone in and taken them off of a proprietary vendor's platform and move them onto a standards-based platform. You know, HTTP2 came out in 2015. It was the first major upgrade to the uh, platform HTTP since 1999. That's when HTTP 1.1 came out. So when we look at standards going from 1999 to 2015, that is something that I would like to invest in. And by investing in those standards, you are slowing down your development process in a positive way because those standards move a little bit more slowly than the framework of the month. And so the framework of the month sometimes is the right solution. 
But more often than not, I will look for a standards-based solution first. I will look for frameworks to sugar up what the platform can't already do for me. Hashtag use the platform indeed. Does that make sense? Yeah? Outstanding. So what have we learned so far? We've learned that really components are nothing more than the ability to create our own new custom HTML elements. That sounds good. We find that all four of these frameworks we identified are all taking that same idea, taking a component-oriented approach. A web component, in fact, is nothing more than a template plus behavior. It's declarative. It's encapsulated. And we do have several options out there. I'm going to favor the ones that are organic, the ones that are leveraging existing W3C specs, because I think that's going to give me a longer term ROI than something that is synthetic. But I use both, and I'll use the right solution for the job, rather than let ideology decide which one I'm going to use. So. We've got three ways that we're going to evaluate web components as well. And I think the most important reason to use web components is for semantics. I've made this argument for years that young developers, new developers right out of university, focus on syntax, not semantics. And why is that? Well, because syntax is easy. Either it's correct or it's not, right? Either it passes the compiler or it doesn't. So syntax is something very easy to focus on. But semantics, the meaning of what we're trying to do, is harder because it requires wisdom. It requires you to have failed on a number of projects. It requires you to know what didn't work so you know what might work as we move forward. So what I love about web components is not necessarily the syntax. As we saw, syntax can come and go. But the semantics are what remain consistent across all those implementation details. So this is the actual HTML5 specification. How many of you have read the HTML5 spec, yeah, at least even a portion of it? Take a moment to look around. I'm going to ask you another question. How many of you consider yourself web developers? Raise your hands. I'm going to ask you the first question again. How many of you have read the rule book to your profession? You now have homework, don't you? This is actually a fairly readable documentation. Yes, sometimes it gets and everything, but it's more readable than you might expect. And I don't know how I could expect to be successful in my job without knowing the rules of my job. So if we read the very first paragraph of this document, it says the World Wide Web, well, the very first paragraph is this section is non-normative. At least one person usually brings that up. Let me read you the second paragraph in the document, yes? The second paragraph reads, the World Wide Web's markup language has always been HTML from the very beginning. This has been true since the mid 80s. We have added things to HTML, we've taken things away from HTML, but the main corpus of this spec has been remarkably stable since the 1980s. And what has this spec been doing for all of this time? HTML was primarily designed as a language for semantically describing scientific documents. Tim Berners-Lee is the gentleman, sir. Tim Berners-Lee is the gentleman who invented the web. And by invented the web, I mean quite literally invented the web. He invented the first web server. He invented the first web browser. He named the first web browser World Wide Web because we're not a particular creative bunch when it comes to naming things, right? He invented the first web server and the first web browser. He invented the protocol that we use to get things between the server and the browser. That's called HTTP, Hypertext Transport Protocol. And he invented the payload, HTML, hypertext markup language. And he did all this at CERN. CERN, of course, where the Large Haldron Collider is going on, yeah? He was working there, and he wanted to find a way to publish word per, excuse me, uh, uh, scientific documents 
not in a proprietary word processor, like WordPerfect, like a me pro, like WordStar. What other word processor should I mention that no longer exists? Yeah? This isn't where we want to wrap up all of our scientific knowledge. We wanted to open it in, a, in, a, in an open standards-based platform. And if you think about describing scientific documents, you say, well, here's my hypothesis, and Dr. Jones hypothesized that this would happen, and Dr. Smith hypothesized that that would happen, and in fact, my study confirms both. Linking between scientific documents is an important thing, isn't it? So if we look at HTML, we look at things like headers, H1, H2, H3, H4. We can see that here because that's how we write scientific documents, right? We go through section 1, section 1.1, section 1.2. So that's native to HTML. We define paragraphs. We define images. We define anchors, hyperlinks to other documents. So this is what HTML is really good for. We can say this is what it was meant for. Now read that next paragraph. The main area that has not been adequately addressed by HTML is a vague subject referred to as web applications. Huh. So everything we're doing on this platform is not wrong. I still think we absolutely can make very successful applications on the web platform. Google Maps, Twitter, Snapchat, yeah, all web-based technologies, Slack. Atom, Visual Studio. You say, wait a second, those are desktop apps, right? You double click on icons there. They're actually Electron JS apps. The framework Electron JS allows you to take V8, the JavaScript runtime, and blink the HTML render kit, but bundle it up as a desktop application. So Slack is, in fact, written in HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. It's a desktop app, but when you double click on it, it is the pieces of Chrome, but not running inside of Chrome. When you double click on the Atom Editor's icon, it's the pieces of Chrome, but not in a web browser. When you run Slack, it's web technology. Web technology that's got a long heritage, but arguably an application. So we can use HTML to build out applications, but the semantics are what I really want to focus on. The what, what, what does this really mean? We're adding meaning to these documents. Now, I've got something up here. This is not a complete recipe, but it is a recipe. The recipe is called Waffles of Insane Greatness. I encourage you to Google that. They are wonderful waffles. My daughter and I make them almost every morning, every uh, weekend, every Sunday morning with fresh buttermilk and, oh, maple syrup. Oh, it's delicious. But up top, we see the syntax. And down below, we see how that's rendered. Now, do you notice a distinction between those two? Notice that we've got nice line breaks and separations up there and everything is all just kind of run together over here? Why is that? What are we missing up here up top that would make our rendering more accurate? We're missing semantics. So if I come up very quickly and do this, if I surround waffles of insane greatness with a header, Ah, oh, that's beginning to look better, isn't it? I'm beginning to add semantics. Now, these are document semantics. These are the parts of the document. This is a header, this is a paragraph, but they're semantics nonetheless. Now, the reason I like this recipe example is because we have two lists we need to deal with. The ingredient list and the directions. We have a couple of different ways of representing lists in HTML as well. We have ordered lists, OLs, and we have unordered lists. What would you treat your ingredient list as? Does that feel like an ordered list to you or an unordered list to you? Unordered, absolutely, because the ingredients are in, aren't in any particular order at all. So I'll say this is an unordered list, and I'll come in and close it up. And then I will tell each one of these that they are a list item. And I will 
do some copying and pasting to make this go a little bit faster. All right. I think you get the idea here. I would greatly prefer to do this in a text editor than a web browser, but I think you can see I have tempted fate and managed to deal with this. Everything that I'm doing here, you might suggest is adding syntax. Syntax is just an implementation detail. I'm adding semantics. And once you add semantics to the document, your job is done as a programmer. That's the whole reason we're here. So what's interesting is if you go reading books about HTML5, they talk about all the new semantic elements. And if you've spent any amount of time as a web developer, you've probably encountered at least one person on your team. Maybe they've had a bad day, but they come in the morning in a bit of a snit, and they huh, snort and grunt a little bit, and they say, I don't know why we have all these stupid elements, paragraphs, and things. I'm just going to do them all in divs. You ever run across anyone that? Yeah, they want to do all their work in divs. You know how they troubleshoot their web pages at the end of the day when it's not working? They just put closing div tags at the end until it starts rendering correctly? Yeah? Yeah? Why don't we do that? Why don't we just use divs for everything? Why did HTML go on and give us not only paragraphs, but navs and sections and asides and articles and all those kinds of things? They are at a syntax level, identically. They're all block level elements. Whatever you wrap in there, they'll give everything a new line at the end of it. So syntactically, they're identical. Semantically, they're different. When we're reading about a section here, we're saying, well, a section should just be that, you know, a, a, a section, a grouping of content. Um, it could be um, chapters in a book. It could be individual tabs on a tabbed page. It could be any number of things, but whatever you think a section is, maybe you just ought to use this element called section. Nav. Nav is really going to be nothing more than a set of anchors, right? A set of hyperlinks. It might be an unordered list of hyperlinks, but those are all document semantics. If you wrap it in a nav, you're providing real semantics. You're saying this is the navigation section. So if you have a screen reader going now, your navigation might be the first thing it encounters on the list. But maybe your screen reader, if you're sight impaired and you're having it read the content to you on your screen, it might have business rules that say, I'm not going to read the navigation. It would be really annoying if every time I move to a new page, it said, home, products, shopping cart, log out, before it got to the important stuff, right? And so that's why we wrap things in semantic elements. Let me give you one more real world example. When you are on your smartphone, and it doesn't matter if it's an Android or an iOS, when you're on a smartphone and you're filling in a form and someone asks you for your email address, and so you click in that email address field, and you do not get the email keyboard that's supposed to pop up. You know what I'm talking about, right? If someone asks you for a URL and you click in there and you don't get the keyboard that pops up with the .com button, who failed there? Does your browser not support that feature? Or perhaps, just perhaps, the programmer behind that page said, I'm just going to use input type equals text for everything, right? Because what's the difference between input type equals text and input type equals email, right? They're both strings. Ah. But one has the semantic hint that your smartphone needs to display the appropriate keyboard. If you say input type equals tell for telephone number, you'll get the phone dialer up. If you say input type equals number, you'll get the numeric keyboard up. And you know what? There's no way for you to force those keyboards to appear using JavaScript. The only way you can get the email keyboard to appear is by using the appropriate semantics. The only way you can get the numeric keyboard to appear is by using semantics. This is crucial. So many new developers think, oh, I got to learn new syntax. No, you got to learn the background. You got to learn why you're doing the things you're doing. So the deal with HTML from the very beginning 
is that it's offered us a fixed set of elements. And so every time we add a new ID or a class, Every time we add a new div and a span, in fact, what that is, is that's us saying, ah, none of the existing HTML elements did what I want them to do. None of them satisfied what I need, so I'm going to fail over to divs and spans. If you read the documentation on div, the HTML div element is a generic container for flow. It doesn't represent anything at all. It's just used to group like content. Span is the same thing. It doesn't give you a carriage return at the end, but span allows you to do that, identify a unique string or a span of text. You can give it a class, you can give it ID, but it is semantically null. And this definition goes on to say it should only be used when no other semantic element is appropriate. Are you a div first developer or a div last developer? I want to ask you to incriminate yourself, yeah? But this is something to think about. This is something to think about. Challenge yourself every time you're using a div. Is there a better element I should be using right now? Could I write my entire application never using a div or a span? I challenge you to that. Because once again, every time you find yourself using a div and a span with a class, if you say div ID equals shopping cart, div class equals customer, class equals invoice item, class equals something like that, what are you doing there? You're defining semantics. So if you're defining semantics, why don't we go all the way and just use XML, right? What does the X in XML stand for? Extensible. We have a language here that has absolutely no fixed rules whatsoever. So in this example right here, they say, oh, we're representing a quiz. Semantically, what do you think they're representing? A quiz. They say a quiz is made up of question and answer. So what do they have next? A Q&A element. What does a Q&A element contain? I know, silly, a question and an answer. But if you look at this, it's brilliant, isn't it? It is semantically rich. The question you're faced with is, how should we display a quiz? How should we display a question? How should we display an answer? Do we want the answer to be in italics? Do we want the answer to be hidden until they provide their own answer? There are all kinds of things we can know out of this. There's no behavior associated with XML. There's no templating associated with XML. It's pure data. We might argue this has turned the semantics knob all the way in one direction, but what we've lost is our fundamental definition of what a component is, which is a template and behavior. So while XML at first blush might be the right answer to our problems, in fact, it's not. Which brings us back to web components. Web components are a set of reusable widgets or components in web documents. The intention is to bring this component-based mentality here, but really what we're doing is we're creating our own elements, and by that I mean we're creating our own semantic elements. Does that make sense? Yeah, excellent. So web components are actually made up of four separate APIs. All these are defined by the W3C, the World Wide Web Consortium. Custom element is just that, an API to actually define a new element. I'm going to create a new element, and it's going to be called my customer. Great. Once you've defined that, we have Shadow DOM. Ah, oh, we'll talk about this, but it comes to encapsulation once again. It's a way that we can encapsulate that element, so any styling you do on that element won't affect the rest of your document. And any styling you've done on your document won't affect your custom element, Shadow DOM. Really fun concept. HTML imports, how are you going to bring this new component in? You need to be able to import it, and oh yes, HTML templates. How do we model this look and feel? These are all the organic elements that I was talking about. This is what Polymer offers a thin syntactic sugar over. This is what Angular 2 offers, a thicker 
syntactic should go over. But fundamentally, an Angular component is a web component. It uses templates under the covers. It uses the, the custom element API and the shadow DOM API. So in fact, uh, uh, Angular 2 is a thick syntactic coding over these organic elements. So if web components offer us semantics, they do also offer us encapsulation. And we've touched on this, but it's nice being able to come back to this idea once again. I have always liked saying that web development is pathologically global. And what I mean by that is everything wants to be global. When you define the DOM, you have one tier of elements. Now, obviously, they're nested, but you can navigate, you can traverse anywhere in that DOM. No part of that DOM is off limits. In fact, the DOM is one big mutable global variable. If you're a jQuery developer, you know exactly what I'm talking about, don't you? How did that get here? I don't know. Let's start by reading every line of JavaScript in this application, right? Because any one of them could have been the one that added this element or changed this element or brought it back out again. Treating the DOM as a big global mutable variable was not one of our industry's finer moments. CSS is global by nature. You define CSS and it can select any DOM node in there. JavaScript is global by nature. When you have a script source, it loads that up into the global namespace. When you have a link rel equals style sheet, it loads that up into the global namespace. You get what I'm saying, right? Yeah. So with the modern web, we're beginning to see them reverse those actions. We've talked about Shadow DOM that effectively encapsulates every one of your web components. So they are isolated on the page. So you don't have to worry about jQuery coming in and messing with your components. Literally, Shadow DOM makes your component invisible to jQuery. Not the outer element, jQuery can see that, but the inner workings, the encapsulated portion, jQuery can't come in and mess with. ES6 introduces to new keyword let. We normally used var to define all of our variables, didn't we? Yes. Or var, define our variables. Yeah. But what does that var keyword do for you? That makes a global variable. What happens if you don't use the var keyword? Oh, it makes a global variable. Rats! That really wants to be global, doesn't it? The only way you can avoid creating global variables is by using the var keyword inside of a function. If you use the var keyword inside of a function, we say that variable has been lexically scoped to just that function. But as Java developers, we feel that variables should be lexically scoped to any block, not just functions. We feel that variables should be lexically scoped to if blocks, right? For for loops, in Java, if you say for int i equals zero, i less than list length, i plus plus, right? Outside of that for loop, can you ever get back to that i variable again? Absolutely not. That variable is lexically scoped to the for loop. In JavaScript, if you say for i equals zero, notice I didn't use the var keyword. If I just say for var i equals zero, i less than length, i plus plus, right? Can you get to the i outside of that for loop? Absolutely. If you use the var keyword, if I say for var i equals zero, can I still get to that i afterwards? Yes. It's only lexically scoped to functions. So what does the let keyword allow you to do? Just use let every word, use var. As a Java developer, I enjoy JavaScript so much more because all of a sudden let lexically scopes my variables to if blocks and for blocks and functions and everything else. In fact, when we're dealing with modules, remember that first line of code we saw, import component from Angular component? That Angular component was a .js file, but we now consider them modules. Any individual JS file is simply a module. It's no special syntax. It's just by the nature of all this JavaScript, being in a separate JavaScript file makes that a module. But what ES6 modules bring to the party now is every variable you define in there is now a private variable. 
What you have to do is explicitly export the variables you want. So when we were able to import component from Angular Core, it's because somewhere in there they said export component. So we could import that. But if component relies on a bunch of internal functions that we don't have to expose out, it's easy. Do nothing. Do exactly what you've been doing since 1995, and now all of a sudden that function will be private instead of public. We can see this is a very important change in the way we approach web development. Things now tend towards privacy. And that's really what encapsulation means as well, doesn't it? Not only is it a distribution mechanism, making sure we can carry everything around with it, and that's an important part of this. I want to make sure that I've got my template and my behavior, but I also want to make sure that it's prying eyes so people can't get in there. So all of these are ideas that come forward with these new web components. Now, this is not a web component yet but it will be in just a moment. This is Google Maps. And I bring this up because I love Google Maps, but I also bring it up because this is a great example of what idiomatic web development looks like right now. You bring in a style sheet, yep, and that's way up there in the global namespace now. Down below, I bring in some JavaScript, script source. That's in the global namespace right now. I create a div with an ID of map, hmm, Kind of feels like I want a map object, don't I? But in fact, I had to use a semantically null element, div, and give it an ID. And then we turn around and use CSS to style that element a little bit differently. And we use JavaScript to select that. This is all very imperative, isn't it? And again, there's nothing wrong with it. This is what we've been doing since 2005 when the first JavaScript API came out. This is as idiomatic as it's going to get, and you end up with a beautiful map. But what if I wanted that same beautiful map in a web component way? Well, it just so happens there's a website called webcomponents.org. Think of this as npmjs.com. NPMJS are where your node modules all live. Webcomponents.org are where all of your web components live. Yeah? So it's a clearinghouse. It's a search engine. Not ironic that it's being supported and maintained by Google, right? Yes. But what does this element allow you to do? Well, it allows you to say, well, I wonder if there's a Google Map element. Oh, in fact, there is. Notice it's got the hyphen in the name. Of course it does. Notice how it's implemented. It gives you some details over here. It's licensed under the Apache 2 license. It was updated two weeks ago. You Bower install this, right? We can see the number of stars on the repo and the forks and watchers and everything else. This is as open as it's going to get. But the syntax, I think, is what's the interesting part of this story. That first line of code, that JavaScript line in there, brings in a polyfill. What we're going to find is these four APIs are implemented at different levels across the four major different browsers. They all support templates. Some of them support custom elements. Some of them have said we absolutely will not support HTML imports, Firefox, IE, Edge, yeah. So we have a typical mixed bag of some browsers support all these, some support some, some support none. But we have this polyfill library. By adding that one line in there in JavaScript, we now supply all the functionality we need across all four APIs to give us 100% support across all browsers. So I'm not worried about native browser support anymore for this when I've got a one-line polyfill that allows me to bring in that support. Notice that next line is my HTML import. That was one of the four APIs we discussed. In one line right here, I'm able to import this new Google Map element. And what's so important about this is as I'm importing it, Google Map Element probably has a bunch of dependencies on its own. It probably needs to bring in its own JavaScript library. It probably needs to bring in additional libraries as well. It probably needs to bring in some CSS and all manner of other things. By doing a one-line HTML import on that, it's bringing in not only that element, but all of its transitive dependencies as well. Incredibly powerful. So what do we end up with now? Do we end up with a div ID equals map? 
No. We end up with Google hyphen map with fit to marker and API key and all manner of things like that. What's inside of it? A Google map marker with its own things inside of it. Now, what I want you to realize is we have just created our own semantic element. We've created an element that represents a Google map that has all of its dependencies. It's shadow domed away. It's HTML imported. It's everything that we want. But now, all of a sudden, I've got this lovely declarative element that I can just start using. And it's a black box. I literally don't know how it was implemented, but I know it works. That's the promise of Web Components in a nutshell right there. So if we were to look at a page like this, from a page-centric perspective, we might say, all right, well, I need to build out that sidebar, those categories on the left, and then I need to build out the list of movies on the right, and then once I'm done, I need to push all of this on the wire. This is kind of a typical server-side rendering. This could be a JSP or an ASP or any kind of server-side technology. So what does that exact same page look like from a component-oriented point of view? Well, I'm not doing a jQuery kind of thing. By the way, jQuery is a fine library. I've used it all over the place. I don't use jQuery anymore. Because jQuery is kind of the antithesis of what we're trying to deal with here. jQuery is a page-centric library that allows you to sweep through your global DOM, make all kinds of changes you want. I literally can't use jQuery for anything interesting if I'm using components. So this is what my pseudocode looks like now. I just kind of knew up a sidebar, and I knew up a movie list. And you start thinking to yourself, well, wait a second. If these are two totally separate components, how does the movie list change every time we choose a new category? Ha, ha, ha. Event listening, right? When you click on a new category here, that sidebar will publish an event. And anyone who is interested in those events will subscribe to that and react accordingly. So as I click on sci-fi over here, the workflow is I will throw a new category changed event. My, ma my main uh, area, the movies, are interested in category changes. So it'll subscribe to that. And when it says, oh, sci-fi, hmm, I'll look and see if I have sci-fi movies in my cache. And if I don't, I'll make an Ajax request and pull them down. But each one of these is a well-encapsulated component, but are able to interact with each other in a very clean, maintainable way. Does that make sense? Yeah? Outstanding. OK. Last thing we want to talk about here are standards. I have just a few minutes left. Not only are web components standard, they're not even a particularly new standard. We have been able to use web components in our browsers since 2009, almost a full decade. The only deal is we haven't been able to define our own custom components. Web components have been around for quite some time. Defining your own new one is what's special about this. But if you go into your uh, uh, um, web browser right now and you set up an input type equals date, or an input type equals name, or an input type equals range, ah, oh, there are those good HTML5 semantics, right? Because a date is different than a number, is different than a range. I wouldn't want these to be input type equals text. Yeah? But the deal is, I'm doing a view source right now. And I know that when I click on that date field, I get this beautiful drop down menu with all kinds of things like that. But I go back, and again, I look at the view source. No tricks. I haven't clipped anything out. I just see input type equals date. Hmm. What does that sound like? Perhaps a web component that's well encapsulated. Yeah? that has all kinds of templating and behavior associated with it, we just can't see it. Well, the deal is we can. If you go into your settings and you enable Shadow DOM, if you throw a checkbox next to Show User Agent Shadow DOM, then all of a sudden, when you expand that out, you're like, oh, look. There's all that stuff I was expecting to see. Now, you won't see any new elements in here. These will be all the elements you can use, but they're encapsulated up and shipped around. So when you say input type equals date, you aren't faced 
with all these implementation details. You aren't faced with empirically, excuse me, imperatively trying to add all this behavior in and say, oh, well, when they click on the drop down menu, I need you to show this div when they click on it again, hide the div when they click on a date, I need you to dismiss. All of that templating and behavior is encapsulated. And if you don't go in and turn on Shadow DOM, it's hidden from you as well. Yeah? So if we go looking at the Shadow DOM for a number, if we go looking at the Shadow DOM for a slider in there, you can learn a lot. You can absolutely take inspiration. And here's the deal. As you're building your own components, you can extend existing components. I probably wouldn't do that. I'm probably going to create my own custom components like shopping carts and customers and invoices. But it is nice knowing that, oh, maybe I can import an image. Maybe I can extend an image, create my own image, but require it to have a fixed set of dimensions on it instead of being optional. In fact, Google has a project called Accelerated Mobile Pages, AMP, and that's all it is. AMP forbids you from having any JavaScript in it at all. But what you can add are any number of web components. And the AMP project supplies you with a number of very mobile-friendly elements. Like instead of using a regular old image source, you'll use an AMP hyphen image. But that AMP image requires a set of dimensions because for accelerated mobile performance, you want to make sure that you always specify your image sizes. So it's a brilliant example of a framework AMP that has no JavaScript in it, but it has a number of components that still give you the behavior of JavaScript, but give it to you in an encapsulated, declarative way. Yeah? All right, so we've covered a lot of ground here. What did we learn? We learned components are kind of popular, whether you're dealing with them in Angular, or you're dealing with them um, in React, or you're dealing with them um, in Ember, or you're dealing with them um, in Polymer, or you're dealing with them um, in Vue, or you're dealing with them um, in Knockout, or you're dealing with, you get the idea, right? Yes, that web components are really kind of a big deal. Sometimes they'll be organic, sometimes they'll be synth uh, synthetic. But really, what we are able to do now is add rich semantics to our document in a declarative, encapsulated way. I'm really excited about this. Are you excited about it as well? Wonderful. Thank you so much for your time and attention today. I sure appreciate it.